From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Vitamin Energy. The vitamins. The energy. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunter Vandy and Corey Clark. Wake up. It's Wake Up Warchant, presented by Vitamin Energy. Coming up on today's show, a winning mindset is being displayed at practice. We discuss some true freshmen showing some true promise. And we empty our observations after the first full pads practice of the preseason. Wake Up War Champ presented by Vitamin Energy. VitaminEnergy.com. Promo code War Champ BOGO. Go do it. Buy one, get one free. War Champ B-O-G-O. VitaminEnergy.com. Vitamin Energy is clinically proven. It's fantastic. 260 milligrams of all natural caffeine. Took the burner plus on Tuesday. Gym pump solid to plus. Check plus solid, Corey. Hope y'all are living how I'm living. You can do it. Buy one, get one free. Leave them at the desk, in the office. Somebody's walking by, moping a little bit. Hey, hey, Bobby. Whew. Toss them a little bottle of the uh, of the vitamin energy. Pick up their spirits. Buy one, get one free. Knowles helping Knowles. Warchant.com still cranking out this promo, Corey. Unbelievable. FSU won. One American dollar, two months of access. So if you sign up now, I don't know, like Florida State's going to be ranked like what? Fourth in the country? And they're going to be 5-0? Uh, and oh? Mm, okay. All Something right. like that? I don't know. Do it, everybody. Come join us over at Warchant.com. You love the pods. You love headlines. You love JCS. Hopefully you love Wake Up Warchant. Uh, but the recruiting stuff, all of it is behind the paywall. And I hate saying the paywall, but like, be a subscriber. Be part of the club. It's awesome. You get a whole bunch of stuff. You get discounts to Garnet and Gold. Um, you also get access to the Renegade Express mailbag. So uh, it all adds up. It all adds up. Corey, how are all you, All of man? our stories. All yeah. of our st- you get access to that, too. Absolutely. I mean, Corey's observations, which, listen, we got to hold them back. You know, sometimes you'd rather tell a guy, you know, whoa, buddy, than giddy up. Uh, right. and with, with Corey, it's, it's whoa, buddy. Let's not give away all the observations. I think one of our guys, shout out, uh, Mathis Jones might have been his name, said that he counted like 58 players you named in your Tuesday, or I'm sorry, your Monday practice observations. That's that's yeah. that's robust, Corey. Yeah, and I get to highlight all of them too as I'm writing them, which is fun. But it, hey, uh, on three has made that much more not the it's inside baseball, but it's much simpler now than it used to be with that highlighting. It's just literally a button that you click, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot of names, and I I, I lost count again today, but I'm gonna guess it's at least uh, for the for the Tuesday practice. Uh, for so t- the Tuesday observations, I would say close to fifty again. Strong. Scholarship. You right. want to know how everybody's doing? Any big plays that were made? Yep. Um, yeah, they're they're in there. All right, we'll talk about some of that here in a second. But uh, I did want to talk about some injury stuff, and I know we can't talk about it, but the door was left ajar today for us to bring some news to you, and that's the DJ Lundy's been limited here in practice. Uh, and that was kind of delivered after the fact that Mike Norvell talked about how much he liked the linebacking core so far. Uh, Cam Riley was a name that kind of jumped to the front of his mind. So anybody that's been wondering about why number 10 might have not been in any videos, now you kind of got your answer. I did want to talk about Destin Hill for a quick minute, Corey, because we, we're getting a lot of questions about that. And and I understand everybody. Like It it, it, lo- it does look funny. Like he We were told he was out for the year. We asked Norvell, Last week, if anything has changed on the timeline of any of the guys, he says no. So Destin Hill's still out for the season. But he's out there in a jersey, not in pads, though. And he's out there mm-hmm. catching balls when the quarterbacks are warming up in, like, periods one and two. And people are starting to, like, oh, like, is this, like, maybe a Winston Wright thing where he's been written off for the year, but he's going to try his darndest to get back in the, the swing of things? And I don't want to be too presumptuous, Corey, but... It, it feels like Destin Hill hasn't life hasn't delivered a lot of pitches right down the heart of the plate for him. Uh, and maybe this injury is like the latest kind of setback. I, I think him, I, I just see like a situation, like a movie almost where he goes into Norvell's offense. just like, man, I, I got to be around this. Like, you know, when Rocky goes and talks to Mickey after Apollo calls him out in Rocky too. And, and, and Mickey's like, listen, man, like you, you can't see out of your eye. You're going to get hurt. And he's like, well, can I come at least work at the gym? I need to be around it. If I'm not around it, I miss it. I think Destin wants to be around football as much as he possibly can. So I think he's like, hey, can I just at least catch balls from the quarterbacks? Like, I won't get in anybody's way. I'm not going to do anything vigorous to risk further injury. So I don't think we should get carried away when we see him out there at practice. But I think it's a really awesome thing. And I'm rooting like hell for that kid because 
I think he'll be like Jameis-esque if he's able to fulfill his potential and just the way that he interacts with the fans, interacts with the media. Like, it won't be interviews after practice with Destin Hill. It's going to be conversations. He's like the nicest, most genuine. Everybody at practice that says anything to Destin, he like stops and has conversation with them. He's an awesome kid. I just wanted to point that out real quick. Sorry. Okay, well said. I don't, I don't really have anything to add. I, I agree with all that. And I do hope that when he does come back, which, again, we, we never thought it would be this year, it does look different that he's out there. Um, that he stays healthy and gets to shine. Because, again, um, what was that, in the spring? Yeah, it was in the spring. Uh, he looked dynamite. Um, he looked dynamite. He looked like he would be playing a whole bunch of football uh, this year for the Florida State foot, for the Florida State Seminoles. It didn't work out. So you do hope that uh, when he when he does get right, um, that he can, sh- he can shine and then go have a career at this sport. Because, yeah, he just seems like a guy that loves it, that wants to be around it, and it was taken away from him for multiple years. Yeah, so man. much that we wondered if he existed. <laughs> um, and, he, and he does exist. He hasn't gotten it. It's, it just, it's been such a slow – just so many hiccups, just such a slow start. It's like, man, you just want the kid to get a break because he deserves it as for all the reasons Aslan pointed out. Yeah, so um, don't get too carried away when it comes to Destin, everybody, when you see him out there. But he is there. Uh, what do you think about the fact that I know you're cranking out observations when Norvell was talking and having his interview and then you got to turn around and go do headlines. But I mean, the fact that, you know, I thought Cam Raleigh did have a good day. I had him listed down a couple of my notes when I think we were either in seven on sevens or 11 yeah. on 11s. And listen, he's six, five, two forty. I think he's listed at maybe two thirty ish. So I don't really, I don't even really know what I was expecting out of him. I, I was, I didn't, I, I would think that maybe pass, uh, situations would maybe be a little bit of a weakness out of him, maybe some sideline to sideline in terms of being able to get to a spot on time. But like he did on Tuesday, it was, and these are full pads, so everybody's crashing down the line as fast as they possibly can. The line's trying to get up the field as fast as they can. Guys are trying to get to their points and their spots. I mean, Cam Riley had a really solid day, I thought, and, and this is becoming a little bit of a, a very positive development for Florida State. Uh, again, their linebackers last year both are in the pros right now, so it wasn't like um, you know they were going to be able to definitely upgrade at that position. I don't think this is necessarily an upgrade, but what do you think about the fact that they were kind of singled out? I, I don't think anybody asked uh, Norvell specifically about linebackers or Cam Rally, but he points out that segment, and they don't have DJ Lundy, who I I would assume, Corey, that you're still, along with me, thinking that once he is fully right and he's back out there, he's probably your best slash most productive linebacker. Uh, yeah, well, he's certainly your most experienced uh, in production-wise. Yeah, I, I would say that, uh, yeah, Lundy's a difference maker if he's out there. Um, but, yeah, I, I think going on talking about Cam Riley, I, I definitely – what I've seen through a week, um, he's going to play. Um, and it's not just it, – Tuesday just wasn't the day. He had a play on Monday, Monday or Sunday, where he uh, – and I think I talked about it, I can't remember – where he ran – you know, he's not running stride for stride with Jalen Lucas. Well, don't, don't get it twisted. But he cut off the angle. Like, he he ran fast enough and got to the spot. He, he had diagnosed the play well enough and ran fast enough that he didn't let him get to the corner, which is what you're always trying to do with a guy like Lucas. Just don't let him get to the corner. And he moved really well to get there. I mean, that is a big human being moving pretty fast for that size. That's what gives you hope, right, that he – he mo- you wondered if he could go sideline to sideline. I, I, it looks to me like he can. You know. And he's been in the SEC for a while, it's, so he, you know he's played this kind of football. He's he started games in the SEC. Um, so I think he's going to play. Um, and I also, somebody that I think we should mention, and, and we talked about on headlines a little bit on Tuesday, um, Sean Murphy yep. has started to stand out more and more. Number 15, he's started to stand out more and more as we've gotten uh, – uh, you know, further along in camp where uh, I force, I, you know, after the spring, I'll be honest with you. I'm like, okay, well that, I don't know. That might've been a miss. I don't, I don't, he just didn't look great, but he didn't know what he was doing. Uh, and I think and, he was and, hurt. And I think he was, maybe hurt. he was hobbled, but he didn't look, yeah. he just, he just didn't look what he was. He didn't look like he knew what he was doing and he didn't look overly as big as he is. He didn't look maybe quick or athletic enough to, to play, um, a lot of reps for this defense. Well, that's changed. He looks more and more to the part now. Um, so maybe he's going to, you know, I still think Cryer and Nicholson are going to play and are slated to play. Um, but I, I, you know, I think they're absolutely getting pushed from the two transfers, uh, mm-hmm. the two SEC transfers. And they, I do think they're going to have a rotation of, what, if you throw Lundy into the mix? I do think five is probably what they might, you know, Mark Graham maybe. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. They, they've, got some, they've got some dudes to throw at the problem. No. Not that it's a problem. Throw it the position. So we'll see who ends up getting the most reps. 
But all those guys I mentioned, every single one of the guys I mentioned, I think is going to play this year. Yeah, I had two times where I circled Sean Murphy's name in the notes from Tuesday. There was one where he, he almost got home, but he got knocked down like as soon as he got through the, off, the offensive line. But I think it was enough to affect the play. And then later on in 11 on 11, uh, he was able to shoot the gap and, and make it home in time, if you will. So uh, he definitely deserved a, a little bit of a shine after his performance on Tuesday. One of the other things, though, that Norvell did mention after practice, I'm glad he pointed it out uh, because I did notice that there's a there's this large like replay board inside the practice facility, everybody, that's kind of almost showing you I mean it's it's almost faster than European soccer replay in terms of like after a play happens, it's up on the screen. Coaches, players can look at it, refer to it, and I'm I'm kind of staring at it a lot of the times, Corey. I think I'll probably be doing that a lot more often. But there was a time where they were doing one on ones, I think, into the into the red zone, maybe it was seven on sevens, where I, I was watching the offensive and defensive lines going at it on one side of the field and I'm I'm keeping one eye on that replay board. I'm like, what is going on? Like, it's been like 15 seconds. They haven't run another play. And he mentioned the fact Norvell did that. He doesn't, he didn't, he didn't like the pace at practice, not necessarily the way they were playing between whistles or, or during plays, but there was, he's, he said there's some moments where they weren't getting enough plays in and they weren't getting lined up quickly enough. I don't know if you remember, maybe, maybe it was only me, but Norvell pointed out too, was there a, a moment in practice where it seemed like they were not not moving at peak efficiency? No, right. I don't know. I don't know which one you're talking about. Sorry, buddy. No, I'm fine. not. I'm not. I'm not disbelieving you. I just don't remember. Yeah. So they are trying to kind of, I think, to a certain degree, maybe drink out of a fire hose. He did say that these first six days have been like an intense, aggressive uh, install for them, which I don't even know how to like interpret that, Corey, because you know he he got asked about where this team is now versus where they were last year and, and a learning curve and. You know, he mentioned that, you know, obviously last year, a bunch of those guys were returning and this year, a lot of the guys are new, but he's still doing like a pretty ambitious six day install that he did here as they got to their first day in pads. Um, Is that belief that these guys can process it and apply it quickly enough? Is that just the way that he wants to operate? Um, Is it the fact that he believes that this program needs to continue performing at an extremely high level and and to get there, they're going to have to do things like maybe push guys a little bit beyond their comfort zone. I just, I know again, you weren't listening to the interview, but like when you you hear the head coach say that, listen, I realize I've got a bunch of new faces, but I'm still installing my offense pretty much at a breakneck uh, pace. How do you kind of uh, process and take what's your takeaway from that? Yeah, I think that's what you. I mean, he's basically like uh, you know, keep up or get left behind, and I, I kind of feel like that's what how you have to coach them um, because a lot of these guys. Especially, like, the line of scrimmage is different, right? But they're, they're just trying to – you don't expect any of those guys on either side of the line of scrimmage as a true freshman to play. But, you know, I don't know, man. Landon Thomas might be able to play. Um, Amari Williams might be able to play a tight end. The way he catches – he seems to catch three or four balls for first downs every yeah. practice. Um, LeWayne McCoy is absolutely going to play. Elijah Moore might be able to play. But Kai Danzi uh, is I, – I can't foresee a scenario where he doesn't at least play some. Um, so you, you basically, it's like, yeah, man, we, you need to get on, you're a part of this team and you might be a part of this team this year. Um, an important part. So catch up. You don't, you can't slow it down for them and you can't, I, I feel like if you start doing that and practicing a different way or slowing it down because you have some newcomers, the standard gets lower just a little bit. Like this is how we practice. And the 20, one hours that you're not out here on these, these fields every day is when you need to study up, catch up, keep up and figure out how to how to play with your teammates. And I think that that I just don't foresee him ever changing the way he practices. He did it in 2020 and 2021 and he's doing it the same exact way in in, in 2024, but that said, you know, I I feel like the miscommunication between the quarterbacks and the receivers seemed a little bit less on Tuesday than it was on Monday which was good to see. There's still going to be some throws where you're like, oh, oh, where was that to? Who was that to? But by and large, it seemed like they were mostly on the same page. And I just feel like it's like you learn more by getting thrown into the fire. And uh, I think he does a good job, of we, as we've talked about, of changing up the lineups a lot. So Charles Lester is running with the ones sometimes. Or LeWayne McCoy is running with the ones sometimes. Or Cam Davis is in the backfield with DJ. You know what I mean? Like I just feel like that's their that's their plan all along is to, in, because they're good enough now, right? 
these guys, these newcomers are good enough, especially the transfers, but the newcomers too are good enough where it's not obvious that they're uh, they're they're fresh on the scene. Like they bo- they belong. It's obvious they belong, and it, that wasn't the case. Maybe uh, the 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 caliber of newcomers they're bringing in has risen significantly. To that point, like David Johnson talking about um, D- Danzy, and that Toa Feely actually admitted to David Johnson, the running backs coach. Yeah, he's better as a freshman than I was. And mm. David Johnson flat out said, yeah, when he was talking to us, he's like, yeah, he is. He's faster. He's obviously faster, but he's a better, more complete back than than Lawrence was when he, Lawrence got here. Now, obviously, Toa Feely is, is a much better college football player right now than Makai Danzi. It's not close. But if if he if Makai Danzi takes the same trajectory that Lawrence Toa Feely took with more talent, well, what's that going to look like in two years? That's exciting, right? And you can say that a, a lot of these guys at multiple positions. We got to hear from the quarterback or one of the quarterbacks. I don't know if we, can, can we call him the quarterback? You know, uh, yes, okay. yes, right. yes. He is the quarterback. Um, it feels weird saying this because again, like you go back and you look at his history, and it's like he he really has he developed a, he got a really bad reputation uh, for no reason and in terms of like wins and losses. Again, I I think it's because he inherited uh, just a he, on the heels of Deshaun Watson and Trevor Lawrence. Those are really lofty standards to meet. Uh, he still ended up winning the ACC. Or I don't think they won the ACC in 21. Was that Kenny Pickett's year that won in 21? I think or Pickett 22? won in 2020. Um, I think no. I think Pickett no. won at COVID, right? No. no. Was that? Oh, yeah, that was Trevor Lawrence. So, yeah, yeah I guess Kenny that. Pickett won it in 21, right? Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, in 22, they still made it to the championship game, and they won it, and, you know, Klubnik was the guy that um, ended up taking it. But you know, when you hear DJ Uwe Ungalale talk about being a teammate and being around his the coaches, like it, you know why Dabo. I don't think Dabo ever really threw him under the bus. I mean, maybe by starting Klubnik in that ACC championship game, it was interpreted that way. But you know, he pushed back for a long time, Dabo, because there were so many questions about you know they just don't they didn't look the same. Like Clemson didn't look the same, um, and like it all falls on the quarterback. And and you know Dabo would do his like smart alecky response about like I'm the coach and I know what I'm doing and I I believe in that kid. Uh, he just seems so genuinely out for the team and nothing but the team and only the team. And, and to hear him talk about the fact that, you know, doesn't make it sound like he thinks the job is his. He's battling Brock every single day. Brock is pushing him. He's pushing Brock. I uh, talked about like the, the lessons he's learned from, you know, just hanging out with Jordan Travis for such a little amount of time. Uh, he also talked about like, you know, it's, it's different this offense in terms of what you have to uh, sort of absorb, uh, but also the fact that, Coach Tokars and Coach Norvell listened to him. I don't know if that was like a, I don't want to say a veiled shot, but maybe kind of a, a glimpse of some perhaps dysfunction at other stops that he kind of had. But it, it seems like he is so comfortable right now and he's so physically gifted that with this kind of, this coaching staff, this culture around him really makes it feel like, you know, his best football, the, the best season of his career uh, is certainly ahead of him and, and hopefully it ends up panning out for him this season, Corey. Yeah, and I thought um, I mean he's always going to be he's always going to be impressive when he's talking. He's just a, he's an impressive guy. But I think um, I, I thought he was impressive on Tuesday. I think he's had a good camp so far. And yeah, you, you know, there's no reason this won't be the best year of his career. It's supposed to be. It's his last one. Um, and he's got so much experience. Um, I, I just feel like uh, he, you know he. he He's going to be a good college quarterback, and he's maybe you hope it's his best ever year. Now there is the unknown of joining a new offense with new terminology and new players, um, but you know he also got here in January, so he's had a full year to go through this. By the time he plays against Georgia Tech, what will he have had, Aslan? Thirty-five practices, like full practices, something like that. Forty, 40? yeah, forty. Yeah, he'll have forty full practices before he plays against Georgia Tech. A guy like that that's played that much football. Well, that's plenty. Like, you know, and I and I do think that, um, as I talked about the other day, he doesn't make those mistakes. He doesn't make a lot of mistakes at all. He did throw an interception in, uh, I guess, one-on-ones. Maybe it was one-on-ones. But it looked like um, the receiver is who they were mad about. Um, so th- they were mad at on that play. Earl Little made the play. It was a really nice play. But it, it appeared that they were not happy with what the receiver did on that play. Uh, but other than that, it's like you know they, he's he's not making mistakes. He's hitting some he's hitting some big plays. He certainly did on uh, on Tuesday with a couple of just fantastic uh, touchdown throws. But he, he just you know that he's 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 
you know that his floor is pretty darn high, man. Like, I know people, we, we talk about this a lot, and we're going to talk about it through the course of the season because he's going to have up and down moments, and he's not going to be a superstar. Uh, Jordan Travis had up and down moments, and there were people that were middle of 2022 still weren't convinced he was any good. So, But that's just the nature of fandom. That's the nature of sports. That's the nature of the quarterback position. There are going to be ups and downs. There's going to be moments where he doesn't look good. But you know the floor for him going into this season is pretty darn high. I just think it's high. It's not Heisman Trophy high, but obviously that's a great floor for somebody to be like, oh, my, if I have a bad season, I'm winning the Heisman Trophy. I, but I think his floor is what – he's not going backwards, right? Mm. He's not going back to 2021. His floor is 2022 and 2023, and go look at those numbers and go look at the wins. And you would – I think most people would absolutely – take that right now, what he did the last two years. And he should be better than that. Well said. We'll have a live show for you folks later today, 6 p.m. Join us. Before then, though, grab your lunch over the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, cptallybar.com, the website, 2475 Appalachian Parkway, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., only eight ninety nine for those daily lunch specials aforementioned in the read there. On Wednesdays, they hook you up with chicken wings, five of them, best chicken wings in town, I say. And French fries, again, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then tomorrow, bingo night at the CP. Is there a limit to the amount of cards you can buy, Corey? You can go crazy, right? They'll let you let's just go absolutely hog wild, try to stack the odds in your favor. Uh, yeah, No, there is no limit. Go yeah. do what you got to do, folks. Mm-hmm. Now, remember, if you win around, it's 250 bucks. So Ooh. it might be cost effective to just flood the market okay. with as many cards as you can get. Now, the the challenge, Aslan, as you could probably understand, is having to mark them all yourself. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, if you get 20 cards and you're having to glance, did he just say B11? Like, is that – do I have that here? Do I have that here? That can be a problem. But, yeah, you can get as many as you want, I think. Does he have a screen behind him, like, showing you what he's called out, or is it only like he, he just – he calls it out and you got you got to listen up and pay attention if that's that? Um. Well, it's a she that does she, it. Sorry. And No, there is a screen. Okay. It can sometimes be hard to read, but okay. I'm blind, so who knows? True. But, yeah, there's a screen on the on the Vegas wall You're that pr- they have there. So you can still keep up that way, but you want to – I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the rush, dude. Yeah. It's the rush of hearing that number and okay. seeing it on. You want to – as soon as you hear it instantaneously, see it on your, on your uh, board and hit it. That's right. Corner pocket, bar and grill. You know, I'm relatively sure if Adam Smith, the father of economics, was with us today – He would be a fan of Manscaped. Smith, as you all remember, argued things like the invisible hand and more importantly, specialization, saying that companies are going to grow, hires are going to be made, and they should have defined roles and specialize in one skill. So yeah, you've got some clippers, but they have a role. Manscaped has a more specialized place in a man's grooming arsenal. Some might say a more delicate role, one involving the moneymaker, to bring it back to Adam Smith and economics. How about the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra? It features skin safe blades and a cordless design, which is kind of clutch. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code WARCHANT at manscaped.com. 20% discount, free shipping. Manscaped.com. Be him and trim. All right, let's get to the um, rest, I guess, of our observations. You did mention there was one interception. I've got in my notes Edwin Joseph, sick INT. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, that wasn't uh, that wasn't DJ though that threw it. Okay. Um, but that was it. That was an incredible play. That was p- probably the play of the day. Was a throw from Barack Glenn to Lewayne McCoy, who we big fans of his on our show. Mm-hmm. Uh, we love that guy, and he, he was fine again. He was good again on Tuesday. But on that particular play at the beginning of practice, they both kind of dove to the ground. Looked like a perfectly good throw from Glenn. But as they're going to the ground. Our man Edwin Joseph just rips it away. And he's celebrating because I was close to that play. Mm. He's celebrating and yelling as he's turning off, like, McCoy's body. Like, he already knew he had it. And he was kind of, like, showing it, like, yelling at the referee, like, hey, I got it. Look, look, I got it. Um, just a really good play, man. Uh, and uh, he had a couple of good plays that day. And so did Jabril Rawls. Mm. Uh, they both they both made some nice plays on, um, uh, on Tuesday. Yeah, I got Rawls with a PBU. Some of the other – uh, younger guys. Uh, I got Cryer with a nice stop on Jalen Lucas in a in a situation that's set up for Jalen Lucas to obviously and clearly succeed, but somehow Cryer was able to kind of get to the spot um, and make the stop. Uh, speaking of Wayne McCoy, while they were inside doing some seven-on-seven seven stuff, and uh, I think the ones and twos were outside and you were watching that, Corey, 
uh, Croman Hawk did find a wide open McCoy uh, for a touchdown while they were doing 11 on 11s. Uh, and you mentioned Amari Williams earlier in the show, man, that might be a, like a, a, a big time steal just because I know he reclassified late. So the, the whole recruiting was a little bit clumsy, maybe for lack of a better term, just in terms of whether or not he was going to be available or not available. And I, I think they almost just kind of, they were able to get it done quickly. I, I think I heard some kind of uh, urban legend where, you know, the family made the decision to uh, reclassify and they wanted to hurry up and get a decision done. They were only going to go to one school and end up picking Florida state for the official. And they came here and then all got done. So uh, he, he looks, I mean, the first day you're like, Oh boy, this is going to be a transition going from playing at the Benjamin school to largely changing positions. Cause he, he played mostly defensive end in high school, but my goodness, in terms of like growth from, from practice one to practice six, I don't know if there's anybody that's made more progress than Amari Williams. Yeah. He's making flashes, flash plays all the time. Like he's, I, like I said, I think he had four or five. He ended the practice with like a 20-yard catch. He had another one a few moments later that was like a 12- or 15-yard catch. Like that guy just keeps uh, standing out. Um, and it's like I would say other than Morlock, he's been – now, understand when I say this. He's been the most impressive tight end, I think, through the first week, uh, other than Morlock. Morlock, who uh, Norvell said on Tuesday had had an unbelievable camp, and he, he's not wrong there. But the pads just came on. And we all know that being a tight end – only half of the job is going out there and catching balls and running around. Like, you've got to be able to be physical and block, and I don't think – we haven't seen it yet, but I, I just can't imagine that Amari Williams is anywhere ready to be on the field in our, as a blocking tight end in the run game. Mm. Um, I just feel like guys like Lola Haya um, can move him quite easily right now, which is to be expected. Like we said, he's, he was in high school for three years. He's listed like – I don't know what he is. He's probably 220 pounds. Like, he's – He's not as big as he's going to get, but man, the fact that this is a kid that that you know, all the guys he grew up with are uh, they're in high school camp right now, and he's at Florida State, competing like this and 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 showing that he belongs, proving he belongs, believing he belongs. Man, what does that say about him in a couple of years? What's he going to look like? That's that's what kind of gets you excited moving forward. Is all these guys again that that floor has been raised with the uh, with with the new guys they brought in with the with the recruits that just. It's a, it's a different. It looks to me, Aslan, like it's a different caliber of player. The the, the McCoys, the Elijah Moores, obviously Danzy and Cam Davis. They just look like Croman Hawk. These are different caliber players at almost every position than we're used to seeing. And Amari Williams certainly fits that bill, man. He's been good. And I saw a thread complaining about the offensive line just about the high school recruiting when are these guys going to start showing up and and being big time difference makers and i get it you know you look around and a bunch of schools get you know these ready-made guys you know the the will campbells if you will that go to lsu and the maui Oga that's down in miami that just day one it's just they arrive at campus it's like all right the clock's starting let's get them for three years and then they're going to be a first round pick probably um, and I know it hasn't materialized that way. And if you, if you really do go back and look at the high school crew, they've, they've have not had a lot of success um, getting guys to, to stick around and get them to, to develop. But I, I, we need to maybe think about guys like Darius Washington, who might not have been a star year one, year two, even year three, and then look at where he is at now. Um, I know Maurice has started for a long time, and, but some people think they might not have been good enough, uh, but he's clearly good enough to be the starting center for a team that should have been in the playoff last year. So, hey, let's be a little bit patient on these guys developing. Because I think guys like, you know, Andre Otto, I think there's really something there. Um, you know, people are like, well, hey, what's the deal with uh, Lucas Simmons? It's like, hey, man, it's it's only year two. You know, like, oh, I figured a few years in the strength and training program with Josh Storms, he'd be, he'd be out there balling. It's like, it's been a year. It's been a year, yeah. uh, singular. I mean, I know he's going to a sophomore year, but it hasn't been two full years of going through all this stuff. Um, but you know, the offensive line, they're obviously looking really strong when they, when they did the inside power running, uh, period of the, of the day, if you will, Corey, instead of like listing down actual names, I'm just looking at the way the play develops and look at the way the coaches react to it. And, um, they, they ran 10 plays if I'm not mistaken. And I had it, um, uh, four for the offense, four for the defense. I'm sorry, three for the offense, three for the defense, and then two stalemates. So that's where they're at as we enter the first day of full pads. I know people might think that there's like an elevation and urgency and, and physicality, but they're they're still playing really hard even the days before they were gone to the full pad. So um, the offensive line, defensive line still pretty going uh, nip and tuck back and forth because both of them are supremely talented units. You know, there was a cool moment um, 
this isn't necessarily an observation on the play, and some of these people might roll their eyes, but I, I think it was Amari Williams actually caught a ball late in practice that maybe he got down to the two. He might have scored. It was a, it was a really nice play, really well thrown by Croman Hawk, all that. Well, Julian Armella, and let, let's just – I think it was Croman Hawk that threw it. If Croman Hawk's on the field, you can understand we're not really allowed to talk about depth charts necessarily. You can understand – Maybe where on the who, who else is on the by. field? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, it might have been Brock Lynn though. I don't remember. But anyway, Julian Armella is on the field, and Julian Armella, as we all know, is a five-star offensive lineman. He's about to start his third year here. He has never played any significant reps, and because the this whole team has got two thousand snaps under their belt, all these guys, he's not going to maybe see any significant reps this year unless there's some injuries. But that's kind of the natural course of things for the most part, as Aslan was talking about. But anyway, that play, we're in July still, man. That play, Amari Williams gets run out at the one or maybe he scores or whatever. But it's a big play, and people are excited. Julian Armella, this is a 25-yard play. He's at the 25-yard line. He sprints down to the corner near the end zone and picks up Amari Williams, which, by the way, shows you how strong Julian is. He's so excited that he runs down and picks him up. And it's like, man... Tell me that's not a good sign. Like, I could say this, and maybe Armella's in the portal today. But, the, I, it's, I, I, gr- granted, I always have a way of jinxing these kind of things. But, man, I just think that says so much about that kid. It, is, it, sells, it, it says so much about um, patience, culture, where development, where he thinks he's going to be, how much he's grown, because that – Football practices are hard for offensive linemen, man. And he might think he should be somewhere else where he should be starting. But instead, he's here as a backup right now, sprinting to go celebrate a sort of touchdown in late July with a freshman tight end. Like, doesn't that, don't you think that says something? That's a cool thing to see because it means he's bought in and invested and he hasn't checked out. When a lot of people in this day and age do check out and they go look for that green grass elsewhere, he's putting in the work here and hoping – expecting, and for all I know, on the trajectory, to be a starting guard for this team next year. When they lose, whatever they lose, 15,000 snaps, they're going to have to do some replacing. He knows that. And he's so bought in that he's he's that invested on a throw to the tight end. I thought that was uh, that was just really cool to see. It caught my eye. Yeah, I don't want to you know get like too schmaltzy, but there's, there's got to be something to what they're doing, to what they're preaching, to whom they're recruiting. Um, I think it's more about what they're preaching, what they've put in place, because I'm sure not everybody, not all 128 players that they've recruited since they've got here or whatever it's been, um, are all going to be totally perfect young gentlemen that see the big picture clearly. But for whatever reason, like when they end up getting here and Alex Atkins has talked about it forever, when he brings these guys in the offensive line room, it's just it's it's just about like figuring out the best five. Like it's just getting the best five and then being the next man up and being ready for that opportunity. Like a guy like Keandre Jones. I mean, that's a guy that played a whole bunch of football, came here, and then really didn't play a lot of football last year. Uh, could have left. Ended up saying, like, yeah. I liked it. I like it here. Like, I'm going to stick it out. And he's had a really good solid camp. So uh, it, it's crazy. It, it really almost defies convention when you think about, again, like a guy like Armella, his sort of makeup, all the – accolades that he's grown up around being the all everything all the time and not maybe having everything work out perfectly right now, but doing selfless things like that, focusing on the important stuff, like picking up his teammate, literally, uh, you know, it's, it's part of me. I don't like talking about it too much core. Cause I'm just like, I feel like the other shoe's going to drop eventually at some point, right. you're going to, you're going to be keeping recruiting these awesome kids and they're not going to fall in line, but um Man, they they all they all buy into it, man. That's why they've been so successful. So I just thought it was, may, or maybe he and Amari had a bet. I, who knows? <laughs> or or they, they they want a bet, or he's that's his best friend, or it was just really neat, it was really neat to see. And you see that stuff like you might see it all at practices all over the country because we how would we know? But um, you you also see something else. You see um, two other things that happen on the field uh, on Tuesday that that I that I noticed that I think are. They say something. I don't know what, but they say something. Well, number one, before I even get – Azaria Thomas took Charles Lester aside coming off the field and talked to him for about 20 seconds and was hitting his temple, the temple of his helmet. like uh, His, his own, own temple? Like he, or, okay. Yeah, his own temple, yeah. like telling Charles Lester to think. Yeah. As he was he was going through what a, what a receiver's doing coming in and out of a break, and then he says – he taps his temple to think, 
and Charles Lester's nodding his head, and then he does it again like his temple, and then pats him on the butt or the shoulder or something and, and put his arm around him. And it's like, man, that you – again, The it, I just think that's more valuable than we know. That, that you know, maybe he's the next Azaria, man. Charles Lester is the next Azaria, and he's got somebody like Azaria – taking him under his wing. In two years from now, Charles Lester might be doing that to the hotshot freshman recruit. That's how it works. That's how it's supposed to work anyway. And it's cool that Azari is taking his time like that with a newcomer and trying to get him better. And then there was another, this, I don't know what this says about Luane McCoy. And we talked about it on headlines, so I'm going to bring it up here too. Um, as they're going from their, their, I think it's their second snack break back inside to finish out practice with like 11 on 11 for 20 minutes. Um, Luane McCoy is jogging. Shaheen Brown is walking from his, from where he was, you know, getting his snackers, water, whatever, back to the indoor practice facility. Luane McCoy jogs by him and like pats him on the shoulder and says, why are we walking? <laughs> um, something to that effect. And then Shaheen Brown, I think playfully, uh, said expletive, I'm not on the field yet. <laughs> and then McCoy, as he's jogging away, has an expletive back to Shaheen Brown. Shah, again, it didn't seem contentious, but it maybe wasn't overly, overly friendly. But then Shaheen Brown lets out, you know, a Shaheen scream and then runs to the other side of the field because that's where the defense is and gets ready for the 11-on-11 or the 7-on-7, whatever they're about to do. And I just think, man, we've talked about his talent. Hakeem Williams talked about how he's just a receiver. He's twitchy, great hands, has a knack for playing the position. But what you don't know about these guys is mindset. Mm -hmm. And I just think it says something about a true freshman. Shaheen Brown, if you guys don't understand, is the leader of the defense and probably the leader of the entire team. Like, I think he is probably the biggest talker. I, if I had to pick one guy to say that's the leader of the 2024 football team, it's Shaheen Brown. And for LeWayne McCoy to give him a little grief, now everybody was walking. It wasn't like Shaheem looked out of place because that's what you walk to the – until the period, the snack period is over, you walk to get in position. So he was just making fun to make fun. But even if it's just a little snide remark, a little bit of S-talking, to have the audacity to do that as a true freshman to the leader of the team, I think that says something about that kid's mindset, man. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I could be wrong. I could be looking way too deep into it. But he's obviously very confident – He's got something to him to go along with because every a lot of people have talent. He's got talent, but what will take him to that next level? I, it's mindset, and it sure looks like he's got the right one. Mm. All right, let's uh, frenetic finish here. Empty out uh, my observations, and you can poke holes in them and add uh, further context, Corey. Uh, so seven on sevens, I had Barker and Rawls with nice PBUs. Nice moment by Kentron Portier. He puts his foot in the ground and is able to kind of change direction and get upfield. And Earl Little just came screaming downfield and try to make a tackle on him, but ended up uh, like rolling and spinning off him just because of the absolute way that Portier was able to stop on a dime and then shift his body with. That was cool to see. Uh, Rawls with another PBU. Then when they went to red zones, I did see a drop by Malik Benson that I did not like. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't yeah. great, but they bounced back the offense. Very next play, uh, Ja'Kai Douglas with a touchdown. Um, and that was just a great throw, it, great it, throw, great route. It was, it's just, it's like, I think it's Norvell's offense too, man. It just, because I kept looking at the screen and Conrad Hussey had a decision to make. Like, is he going to yeah. zig or is he going to zag? And he zigged and Ja'Kai decided to zag. And, you know, you can't really do anything when Ja'Kai decides to do that. You don't know what he's doing. So uh, that was maybe one of the, the nicer exchanges of the day. Rawls uh, affecting a play with some pressure. Uh, I, I had McCoy with a nice catch. I just wrote McCoy beauty. You might know more about yeah, that than I do. Leaping catch. He had a leaping catch oh, at the sideline over uh, Kai Bates. Yeah. Really impressive uh, vertical to get up and get that. And then I, th I saw Devontae Phillips and Charles Lester do a really good job communicating on a a play where the offense was trying to pretty much get get them tied up, if you will, get them. Uh, Devontae Brown, you mean? Did I say who did I say? Devontae Phillips. You said Devontae Phillips. I'm going to yeah. say Devontae Phillips so many times. I don't know. Okay, Shout out. That's fair. Uh, good no, for him. No, Devontae Brown. Uh, no disrespect. But yeah, him and Lester did a really good job communicating, handing guys off, and, and being in coverage on that play. So, a uh, tip of the cap to them. Uh, more lock in KJ Jones, Keandre Jones did a fantastic job comboing up in 11 on 11s, uh, springing up a play, uh, got a TFL from our guy who's number 18 on defense. Yeah. That's Cam Riley. Cam Riley. Yeah. Yeah. That was the one on, on Malik Benson. Uh, the good play from Sean Murphy, where he was able to shoot the gap, uh, shout out to Brock Glenn for having good 
sort of a football IQ in a play where he saw something was coming and uh, he ran in the opposite direction of it and busted off a long run. Or maybe he yeah. actually ran right into the teeth of it because he knew it was going to be over-pursuing him. Uh, then I had Lester with another good coverage on a, a play that was going to be really tricky for him to have to kind of... He had he had several decisions that he was going to have to make in a very short amount of time. He made the right decision um, and had really good coverage. Might have been able to be caught, but he was enough in the... And it might have been on McCoy too, but he was in the vicinity and I think he caused enough... Uh, confusion or enough uh, fear with his presence that he created in completion there. Uh, then also a nice uh, combo up by Amari Williams and a Manasseh ITT to spring a run by number 27. His first name is Zay. I don't know his last name, but he's a walk on running back parks parks. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Yes. You guys want uh, the, the, that walk on to be like, Hey, what's going on with him? Uh, he's the one maybe for uh, the 2024 preseason. Uh, Richie Leonard absolutely stoned somebody on a blitz um, on a completion. I ended up going to, uh, our guy from Virginia, what's the guy, um, 86, Brian Courtney? Brian yeah, Courtney, Courtney, yeah. Um, DJ also showing good awareness with uh, some exotic stuff that the defense was trying to bring his way, and he was able to, to get a gain that probably would have gone for nothing. And um, 31, who's 31 on defense? Um, I DeMarco should, Ward. Look at I'm you, crushing Corey. you. You are, man. Uh, he did a good job. His number was called and um, kind of wrecked the play a little bit. So that, that's all the stuff I have in my notebook, Corey. Um, anything else you want to add? You did a good job of clearing me up and um, correcting the stuff. Yeah, I I'm no, no, no names. I'm not. That's not usually my strength anymore. This is in the 1991 media guide, but I'm still crushing it. Um, you, I would say uh, Portier uh, and Jakai both had multiple big catches. In fact, D- Douglas should have had like an 80-yard touchdown in a, in the first uh, the first 11 on 11 outside, but DJ just overthrew him. But great route, uh, 50 yards downfield. Need him to put that on him. I thought that was really DJ's only bad mistake of the day, accuracy wise, because you make that throw. He was he was seven yards clear of the DB. That throw needed to be made. Um, Hikey Williams had Hikey Williams had a long TD catch. Thought he looked good uh, at least early on in practice. And then um, Portier. You said Portier. Portier. Right? But back to Portier. Uh, Portier made uh, the. I thought the the catch of the day was. Um, they did a situation where it was like the ball's at like the 30, the, the defense is 37. It's third and 10. This was the situation. And then, you know, depending on what happened on third down, they'd either go for it on fourth down, they'd kick a field goal, they'd punt, whatever. Um, in fact, they did punt one time from the 37, twice. Uh, the Mastermato's first one landed a yard into the end zone, and the second was downed at like the 10. But this play um, – Portier got a step on Cypress, uh, really, literally just a step. He was not, like, wide, wide open. He was behind Cypress, but not by much. And uh, DJ just put a dime right around the goal line, and Portier did a great job of running up under it and at the last – because it looked like it was just going to be just out of his reach and hands catching it at full extension uh, for a touchdown that the offense got very excited about with, with good reason. That was, I thought, probably the throw of the day – other than the two that you already mentioned, the one to Douglas in the well in the end zone, there was a touchdown, mm. and then the one that Benson couldn't come down with. Those were great throws as well. That's why I'm saying I, DJ's making a lot of more great and good throws than he is poor throws. Yes, and he seems to be seeing it a little quicker now, seeing it a little faster, which is all part of playing the position. So um, yeah, that that's all I would say. Um, and also, the more I watch, we've talked about him. The more I watch practice, the more I feel like uh, Danzy will be on the field this year in some capacity. Right. He ain't going to be a starter. He ain't going to get 18 carries. He will be on a field in some capacity. They just you – can't, you can't have that speed, that kind of speed, that kind of weapon. Because he makes two plays a day, Aslan, where you're like, <laughs> oh, my goodness. You can't have that kind of weapon just standing on the sideline. I don't care that he's a, he just got here. He needs to be playing, um, and I think he will. I think he will play some this year. They got a ton of backs, man. They got five of them. They, you know, when you talk about Toa Feely, um, Kaziah Holmes, Roy Dell Williams, Jalen Lucas, and Danzy. That's five guys. We co- we coined them Magic Legs, by the way, Danzy. Magic. That's legs. his new nickname. All right, cool. So the re- how we got there was I suggested and somebody else in the chat on headlines. Because for an hour and a half, Aslan, I was trying to come up with a clever nickname of the Eustanzi. And all I had was Danzy the Manzy, yeah. which 
that's not great. No. Or uh, I think I had the boss from Tony Danza. Like, who's the boss? Tony Danza, <laughs> but it's Danzy. We were, I was struggling. Mona, come on. And, yeah, Angela, <laughs> Samantha, uh, and then. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a, my buddy, a buddy of mine used to always do that impression. Um, he would uh, – so – but then I said, what about Lieutenant Danzy? And somebody in the chat said that too. Like the yes. lieutenant is a really good nickname, the lieutenant. But then somebody rightly pointed out, Lieutenant Dan doesn't have legs in that movie. So that kind of – Well, that's the whole thing, though, but know, he's got amazing legs. It's like well, it plays off the – uh, so he doesn't have he he for most of the movie he's legless because right. they got blown off in Vietnam. But Spoiler then alert! Somebody, sorry, kids. Sorry, guys. If you haven't seen Forrest Gump, it works out in the end for everyone. Um, except I guess Kennedy gets shot. Uh, uh, for, Forrest Gump wasn't on hand for the Kennedy assassination, right? He was just he met him as the right. uh, all American. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but at the end of that movie, somebody in the chat pointed out that Forrest Gump says, "Oh, Lieutenant Dan, you've got magic legs." Uh. So that's where Lieutenant Danzy, Lu Magic Legs, comes from. Plus, it's a cool nickname, man. I'm, uh, too many times, all we do now, and I'm the worst about it, is we just give guys nicknames based on their names. And their They're number. just plays of their names. KD. Yeah. Uh, JT13. Like, who called George yeah, Jones JT13 stuff. except people on the internet? Stop it. Back Sorry. in the 30s, you had the Galloping Ghost. Right. You had three finger brown. You had all the well. Actually, he did only have three fingers. So oil can a, Boyd. The, oil I mean, can the I Iron remember. Horse, yeah. the Bambino, the Splendid Splinter for Ted Williams. Like they had all these crazy nicknames that had nothing to do with their actual name. So I think Magic Legs is going to stick. Okay. He needs to be a player. Yeah. He needs to make some plays. But uh, so anyway, so we call it Magic Legs. But dancy has got to play some man. That's just it's too impressive and too big a weapon. In He's not doing it against scrubs. He's not doing it against third stringers all the time and, and walk-ons and, and true freshmen. He's doing it against the goods, too. I like how you and, said uh, that. Yeah, that's that's a new yeah, thing, the goods. And, instead of the ones, the goods. And, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's going to play if he can stay healthy. All right. Look at that robust show for you, everybody. Uh, no practice today, but it doesn't mean there won't be stuff to talk about. We're going to do a live show, 6 p.m. Eastern time, live. Right, here we go. YouTube, come join us, post your questions, um, hit the thumbs up, all that kind of stuff. Then we'll do a Renegade Express mailbag for you folks Thursday. Uh, we'll record that after we watch practice for your Friday uh, pleasure and enjoyment and viewing. So we'll have another practice that we can uh, look at before we take the mailbag questions at the end of the week. So get involved, everybody. Warchant.com's got you covered. Uh, subscribe, FSU1, promo code, two months, $1. Can't beat it. He's Corey, I'm Aslan. Thanks for listening to Wake Up Warchant, presented by Vitamin Energy.